Hi, best friends. Welcome back. I've tricked you. You're going to learn something today. That's right. You thought you came here for comedy, didn't you? Well, guess what? School's in session, and let Miss Jacob teach you a thing or two. So, I actually wanted to talk about a real thing today. That thing is the jigsaw method. I know what you're thinking. I have no idea what that is, or maybe you do, but I feel like most people I mention this to have no idea what I'm talking about. So I thought, why not make a video about it? I'm going to try and be as fair as possible here in my analysis of the jigsaw method of teaching. I make no claims that I don't have a lot of problems with it, because honestly I do, but I find it super fascinating and interesting in the overall discussion that is, how do we teach kids? How do kids learn best? I just think it's nice to occasionally learn a new thing once in a while. So I implore you, just because this isn't a funny video, doesn't mean it's not worth watching. Unless you just absolutely could not care less about this topic. But if I do my job right, by the end, hopefully, you'll be a little more interested in this topic so let's actually learn something today. Oh my God, class, look at us, we're learning. Let's begin at the beginning. In the late 1950s, America was going through desegregation. Let's just say segregation is not the brightest spot on our permanent record, to say the least. As these schools were being desegregated, which means as these races, and ethnicities were now going to the same schools, we ran into a bit of a problem. That problem being, it hadn't been like that. The schools had been separated. Kids hadn't mixed or mingled. And in fact, in most cases, were not happy to mix or mingle. Now, this video is not on segregation or desegregation or the integration into schools. That's a topic for a whole other time and probably for a whole other person. I only bring this up because the teaching method I'm going to talk to you about today does tie into segregation. So in the 1970s, things were still um, not so great as far as school integrations go. It still felt very separate. Teachers were at a loss as to how to get these groups to mix and mingle and frankly, to get along. And now we get to the jigsaw method. It was created by Dr. Elliot Aronson. I hope I'm saying that correctly. And he came up with an idea that he thought would help A, teach the students better and B, force the students to interact in order to succeed thus creating a more cohesive classroom unit. I poured over multiple studies on this. Some have mixed results, but the general consensus is that it does help as far as introducing diversity to students and opening students up to learning from people of all different backgrounds, colors, religions, all of that. So you could call this a pretty big success this doctor introduced this method that was helping these kids in these fairly newly desegregated schools interact, get along, and learn together. And that's great, but again, not what we're here to talk about. So this technique, um, you can look it up yourself. I did, I, I did a lot of research for this, and I personally experienced this method when Around the 10th grade, a few of my teachers started to use it with a lot of frequency. It was almost every lesson became this jigsaw method. It even followed me to the 11th grade and senior year, I, it just sort of dropped off the face of the map for me. I never did it again, but I do remember it vividly for those two grades that I did do it for. And I remember I'll be blunt, I hated it. I did not like it. I saw a lot of flaws with the method um, and it just seemed like I was taking crazy pills. I just, I seemed to be the only one that was noticing these things. Uh, and I've often wondered why that is. Why only me? Why did I have a problem with this method? 
let's break that down. First up is obviously, Jacob, please, for the love of God, explain what this is because I have no idea. Well, I will class, so let's get to it. I'm going to walk you through with an example of how this method works and how you're supposed to do it. So just stay tuned and you'll know all you need to know about it and then I'll bring it right back and we'll talk about it. All right, bye. Ooh. In my research on the jigsaw method, I actually discovered that there were two main methods you could use. I experienced the second one I'll talk about, but I'm gonna go through them both here for you so that you have a better grasp on what I'm even talking about. For both methods, we'll be using this example board with each jigsaw piece representing a student. As you can see, I've split the students into six groups of six students each. This way, the groups are evenly spread and can be mixed up later. Method one. All right, so you're the teacher. And today's lesson plan is colors, something easy. The colors you need to teach the class about today are red, yellow, blue, green, purple, and pink. So, in a traditional classroom, you might have all the students seated and teach them everything you can about those six different colors. Jigsaw method one has you do things a bit differently. Let's walk through it. In method one, each of these groups of six are going to be referred to as home groups. This is your home group that you are assigned by the teacher. Each student in each home group will be assigned one of the six colors. That means in each group, there'll be one student assigned to red, one for yellow, one for blue, one for green, one for purple, and one for pink. Each of those students takes time learning about that specific color. So you have each student representing each color in each group. They individually learn about their color then, after some time has passed, you will rearrange the groups. There's still going to be six groups of six students. Only now, the groups are organized so that every group is only made up of the students studying that specific color. So that means, for instance, you would split the groups up and reform them based on color. So all the students studying red, all the students studying yellow, all the students studying blue, all the students studying green, all the students studying purple, and all the students studying pink. Once you've reformed these second groups, also known as expert groups, those students take time sharing all the information they gathered in their home group on their specific color that was assigned to them. After they've taken the time to share their findings, we're going to break these groups up one more time. The groups will be reformed into the original home groups, which means, once again, each student representing a different color in each group. Back to the original groups. Now that they're back in their original groups, each student will take a turn sharing their findings on their color based on what they learned in their first session with their home group and what they learned in their second session with their expert group with the end goal being that each student in each group now has a good understanding of each of the six colors you are learning today. You can teach almost any subject using this method. Now let's cover method number two. Method two is very similar and it's the one that I've had experiences with. Once again, you are the teacher in this example. Again, splitting the class into six groups of six for this example, and again with the lesson being on those six colors, red, yellow, blue, green, purple, and pink. But now, instead of having a home group, expert group, and then going back to your home group, we do things a little differently. We start with the expert groups, meaning each group is immediately assigned one color to learn about. So we might say red, yellow, blue, green, purple, pink. All the students are studying that same color and they work to learn as much as they can about that color. 
And after a period of time has passed, once again, you break the groups up and reform them. And now you reform them into groups similar to the home groups of the first method, meaning these second groups should have one student from each of the other groups, each having one of the six colors. Those students will share their findings on their assigned color based on what they learned with their entire first group. And again, the end goal is intended to be all students now know about all six colors. I think it's quite obvious why this is called the jigsaw method. Obviously, its intended use is to break information up and have the students teach each other to give them a feeling of accountability and being in charge of their own education and proud when they teach someone something about their assigned topic, in this case, their assigned color. Oh, I didn't see you there. You're back. Now that you have a grasp of what it is and how it works, you're probably in one of two camps. The first camp being, I don't see any issue with this. What's the problem? It seems like a fun, creative idea that will do exactly as you said it would do. Promote integration among the students and discussion and cooperation. And then the other camp would be me saying, I see a lot of immediate flaws with this. I see a lot of ways in which this might not work or is kind of detrimental to learning something new. So quick recap overview. Jigsaw method is split the information up, assign it to different people or different groups. Each person is kind of in charge of their own part of the information. Then all come back together, share your information among your little groups. Boom, you know the material now. As I said, I dealt with this a lot in 10th grade and somewhat in 11th grade, and then it sort of fell off. That was enough for me dealing with it. I did not like it, again, as I've said. So let's go through my experience. This is my experience, no one else's. If you've done this or you're a teacher and you use this, this isn't me saying you're a bad teacher or you're a bad student. This is me saying it didn't work for me and I feel like my reasons weren't so specific that they couldn't be applied to other students. It worked poorly on every occasion that I encountered it personally. I never felt connected to the material and I never believed the things I was being taught by a peer. I dealt mainly with method two, where we were split into a group, assigned a topic as that group, learned it, and then were split back into new groups where you were responsible for teaching your group's topic to the rest of your group who obviously don't know anything about it yet. And you piece all of those pieces together like a jigsaw puzzle and you figure out what it is or you learn about it or whatever. You just got every cue and every clue that most of the members of your second group didn't have a clear grasp on what they were trying to teach you. It was heavily implied once in their second group that people didn't understand what it was they were supposed to retain from their first group and what it was they were supposed to bring to you in this new group. Meaning, they don't know what to teach you because they're not trained to be a teacher. It also became a very good barometer for popularity. The better dressed, more attractive kids with a lot of clout in the school generally saw this as a time to shine, which says nothing of the class clown element and I'll get into both of these two problems a little later. The groups also tended to be big enough where the info dump of a multiple topic discussion wasn't going to be that helpful to me as a student to learn a new subject, to learn new material. It just felt like blurbs, little blurbs from each person, and I couldn't grasp onto any of them or believe them. I never felt like I'm really learning from my peers. I felt like we're being forced to do something and everyone is very lukewarm about it. For me, I never got the feeling that everyone else was loving it and I was the odd man out. At least in the classrooms I've been in, with the classes that I had, it didn't work. It just sort of boiled down into this lukewarm stew of factoids and notes poorly taken and poorly relayed Overall, I came away feeling like I would have rather just learned the entire chapter, topic, whatever it is, by myself, on my own. 
or be taught by the teacher who has expertise in the subject. When I first had it explained to me what we were going to be doing that day by the teacher, I immediately had this negative reaction and not in the typical, oh no, group projects, I'm shy and quiet and weird. I mean, I'm sure I was all those things, but I just didn't like the idea. I felt like I'm not gonna learn what I'm supposed to learn if I have these kids teach it to me because they don't care, nobody cares. And turns out I was right. I never learned anything from it. It was just a mess of facts. I remember one time, we'd been doing it for about two months in one of our classes, and the teacher announced one day, we're gonna do another jigsaw exercise. Is everyone excited? To no reaction at all from the class. I raised my hand. The thing in question was a 10 page chapter that we were going to break up into pages and groups and do this method and mix it together. And I just didn't want to do that. And I said, can I not do this? And I'm paraphrasing here, it was a long time ago. Can I not do this? It's not gonna work for me. This method isn't working for me. And I find that when a teacher goes to a workshop or reads online a new teaching method, sometimes, and definitely not always, probably not even most of the time, but sometimes, they get defensive. It's, it's this new exciting idea that they like the theory of and they wanna implement it. And if you're gonna fight that, well then you're a problem or you're being difficult or bratty or what have you. I knew this process wasn't going to work for me and I was trying to opt out of it. And the teacher immediately said to me, oh, okay, well you can read all 10 pages on your own then. And I think she thought this was a really big gotcha moment for her. I replied, okay and was totally fine with it. I wasn't trying to be snarky or snotty or contrarian. That's what I wanted. I have never seen someone backpedal up a hill so quickly because immediately she says, well, you're doing it anyways. As in, you're gonna do the exercise anyways because she thought she was calling a lazy student's bluff. She thought she was gonna say that and I would go, oh no, I just didn't want to do the work. Oh darn, you got me. But that was absolutely not my issue. And so when I called her bluff and said, all right, I'll do it that way, she immediately had to erase that. I find this defensiveness around this method almost unanimous. In all the classes for the two years that I encountered it, I encountered this level of like, how do I explain it? I encountered a level of, I found out this method, we're gonna do it this way, and you're gonna learn well from it. And if you're telling me that that's not what's gonna happen, you are being difficult, you are the problem. That's not the problem. I'll be honest and say, the problem is, I grew up in Farmington, Minnesota. Very middle class to upper middle class. So this teaching strategy, designed, designed around desegregation and a mixing of cultures and backgrounds. I don't understand what it was supposed to do for my class that was about as diverse as a loaf of white bread. And certainly we had students of different races at our school, but the overwhelming majority was white. And in every class I did it in, it was pretty much all white kids. And sure, fine, you can still do it. I just, if the method's real intention is to learn while forming bonds with students of different backgrounds, well, it fails. It objectively just fails on that level because that was never going to happen. You have me, lower middle class, sitting with mostly upper middle class kids with their suburban cookie cutter homes, with perfect bedroom sets bought by their parents, or hell, even having a bed, I would consider a luxury, or at least I would have considered a luxury. But you get what I'm saying. I didn't feel like they had a background that was really unique and interesting and I didn't understand and I just wanted to get closer to it and wrap my head around it. and. I knew where these kids were coming from, and they knew that I was the quiet weirdo that they thought might blow up the school. 
In an effort to be fair, let's go through some positive. The question of, does it promote a diverse learning environment? Male, female, black, white, etc., etc. Sure, I think that's great. Do I think there are places this could be applied well? Absolutely. I also think our teachers that did it did not do it correctly. They did not follow through on all the steps. That in any case, with any topic, is basically taking the ship out of the harbor as a whole pours water in. If you're not gonna do it right, you should not do it. And I do not believe it was implemented correctly. I do think that for a lot of classrooms, this could work. And I do think that it has its place and its time. I'm not here telling you that if you're a teacher and you like this idea, or you do this idea, or you've done this idea, that you've done something bad or wrong. Absolutely not. I would just ask myself as a teacher, as an educator, is this working for my classroom, in my state, with my kids? Don't just learn it, get excited about what a creative method it is and what a social method it is and immediately implement it because you now learned it. I think that that's not going to serve anyone except you. It's your little pet project. And I don't necessarily think you should be looking for teaching techniques that are the most unique or new, to you at least. Obviously this has been around for a while. Places I think this could work. University or college. In that environment where everyone there is paying a lot of money because they're most likely passionate about that material, let's say it's law. If I'm going to law school or pre-law, I care about that topic, I care about that subject. And doing this jigsaw exercise to learn something about it, or many things about it, I think could go really well because every student is invested in the material and every student cares about really learning it. And when they have to convey it to other students, I think they're going to care and the students that are listening are going to ask questions. Well, what else did you learn? Did I miss something? Oh, so what you're saying is this, this, and this. If your students care about the material, this method absolutely will work if implemented correctly. I also think in a multicultural environment, as in classrooms that are in areas with huge spread outs of race, gender, sexuality, this could really work. If there's a lot of diversity in your classroom, this could be a good way to pull everyone together and get everyone working with each other, talking with each other, learning from each other, which is, I believe, its intention. So I think that's great. And I do think it can work. I just think when I encountered it, it was poorly implemented for the wrong subject, in the wrong class, in the wrong town, at the wrong time. And I just don't know how that was going to go well. So my negatives. Why did I hate it so much? How much time you got? Beginning at the top of the list, Right away, I got this feeling of child labor, as in, if we're going to be teaching each other and then splitting off into groups and still teaching each other, what are you, Mr. or Mrs. Teacher, what are you going to be doing? Now, most of the guides that I've read, and I've read through several on this method, have described that the teacher should be walking around the room, keeping everything in check, checking on the groups. But realistically, when you get down to it, I'm still doing, I'm still teaching and I'm being taught by my peers. And I get that that's supposed to be cute and fun and kitsch. It just kind of felt like I was doing someone's job. It was a little honestly demoralizing. I just felt like, I don't feel like you trust me so much that you're allowing me to teach the material. I feel like you don't know how to teach it to this rowdy classroom of crazy kids. So we're now left to our own devices. You gave us the keys to the kingdom and now we're running it and you're just sort of chilling. Because FYI, she just sat at her desk. She didn't even go around and make sure the groups were on task. It was split up, here's all the material, you learn it, you teach it, you do the work. I'm gonna go sit at my desk and read. Does that sound like a super evolved, progressive teaching method? Or does it sound like, oh, so you want them to do it for you? Which is exactly how it felt to me. 
Now, we obviously have the other glaring flaw, shy students, withdrawn students, students that are weird or just in general quiet. What are they supposed to do? Now, group projects are a thing you will encounter through your whole school career. So I'm not saying let's do away with group projects because some kids are shy. I'm just saying, generally when you are in a group project, you feel a sense of we're all in this together. And when you do this jigsaw method, since you have only a piece of the information meant to complete the puzzle, you do feel a different kind of pressure. This pressure being, if I don't do my part, if I don't learn my portion and teach it, correctly, these kids are going to fail my portion. It is like filling out a jigsaw puzzle and knowing that you're going to be missing a piece. You will never complete it because that piece is missing. And what do you do then? I found an article online directed to teachers on how to implement this in their classroom. And it did have a little blurb about here are some of the drawbacks to this method. And I just found them to be kind of laughable. One point was, Sometimes you'll have students in your class that are shy or withdrawn. That's it. It doesn't explain what to do or how to handle that. That's like saying, sometimes when you're trying to put a square peg through a round hole, the peg is square. Okay, well, what do I do then? What do I do if I have a shy student? If I have a shy or withdrawn student, what do I do next to get them invested in this? Because this exercise is supposed to make them come out of their shell, but we all know kids. We know that's not how it works. I was a kid, I know. And I remember talking to my peers, that's not how it worked. You didn't just get over shyness because you were clumped with other people and told to teach them. That never works. I shouldn't say never, sometimes it does, but in my experience, it never worked. And I wasn't even shy. So if you're being told, sometimes you'll have a shy student, and you say, well, what do I do then? And their response is, well, well sometimes, um, sometimes you'll have a shy student. Okay, great. So no response, basically just, well, that kid's going to be screwed and they're not really gonna benefit from this and will actively have a hard time learning from it and taking in information and presenting information. So whatever group they're in is basically just sentenced to death. There it is. I think most kids say that forced group projects with groups that they don't get to pick are actively hellish and horrible. Two big things sink this method for me. Number one popular kids. Pretty much what's going to happen, and I'm going to walk you through it, and these, this evidence is anecdotal. It's just mine. It's my own. So obviously you could say, oh, well, that's not what happened in my classroom when I did this or what have you, but this is my experience. So it is what it is. When you get in these groups, the popular kids, meaning upper middle class, very wealthy families, nicely dressed, well-groomed, they will get all the attention and they will shine. Shine so brightly that basically it becomes whoever in your group is considered popular will just kind of chat amongst themselves and have a fun time and treat it like a social hour. And if you're not that, you are ignored. And that's basically it. You're just ignored. You don't exist in this group anymore. And I do love that one of the suggestions on the website was appoint a group leader. Oh, great. So you have one of two options, really. Appoint the popular kid because you're desperate for your youth and want to identify with these kids. And basically, that popular kid is now in charge and now they're an even bigger star. Or appoint the quiet weirdo because you want them to come out of their shell and you think giving them a bit of responsibility is going to do that and it doesn't, it won't, they will be really quiet and awkward, and any of the popular kids in their group will snicker and sneer and talk amongst themselves now about how that kid is now their leader. The second biggest killer of this method for me, and what I would say is the silver bullet, the lead balloon, whatever you wanna say, 
is class clowns. Every time I've done this method, every time without fail, I got put in a group with a class clown. Now, in addition to being really irritating and annoying, my opinion, this is what will happen. The class clown, if they're in your first group, will goof around, not study their material, or at least skim it. Then if they're in your second group, they will treat it like they've been given a comedy set at the local coffee house and that they're about to be discovered. And heaven forbid and heaven help you because most of their set of comedy that they're wishing to be discovered with will revolve around I barely even read it. I just skimmed it. What's even going on? Oh, me too stupid to understand. Am I right? Am I right? And that's what you get. That's their contribution. And a lot of the websites will say, oh, make sure they're on task. So if the teacher comes over and tells that class clown, Hey, you. Stop goofing off. All that's going to happen is they will get quiet, stop talking, and shut down. Basically, it's either their dream job, their comedy set, they're going to be discovered, it's their time to shine, or they're completely silent, they don't say two words because they got in trouble. It is the biggest killer of this method. I always got a class clown in my group, and always they monopolized all the time, didn't explain whatever portion they were supposed to explain, and I came away missing several pieces. And frankly, I can tell you how this went every single time. You're there, you're in your group, maybe you tried or you didn't try, doesn't matter. Let's not even look at you right now. The rest of your group, there's someone that read the material, they don't understand it. They don't understand what they were supposed to take notes on, they don't understand what they were supposed to present, they don't understand the topic in general. You've got a really shy person, they're not talking at all. If you can get any words out of them, it's maybe the headers of the part of the chapter that they were supposed to read, you know, the bold text, and nothing else. You can barely get them to say two words. You have two popular girls, they're talking with each other. When it comes to their turn to present their information, they half-heartedly give you an incoherent babbling response, and you don't understand anything about what they learned even if they did understand it perfectly, you don't understand what they've explained to you. Maybe you're lucky and you'll get one kid in your group that actually did it and actually understands what information you're supposed to learn. But hey, it's a crapshoot anyways because we're not trained to be teachers, so who even understands what information we're supposed to be taking in and what information we're supposed to be relaying? I basically think that this is not a teaching method, it's a social experiment. I think that this is like those mix and mingle get to know you games. And as that, I absolutely think it works. A hundred percent. But as an actual teaching method to learn a new subject or a new topic, especially a topic that, let's face it, the kids probably aren't going to really care about or know anything about beforehand. It does not work. It has fatal flaws, obvious flaws. What do you think? Do you think it works? If you're a teacher, has it worked in your classrooms? Why did it work? Why do you think it didn't work for me or in my classrooms? Everyone learns differently. Not all teaching methods are going to work for every single student. It's hard. Like and subscribe for more educational content. Remember, this channel is worth college credit. Goodbye.